I am very glad to introduce then Rob Hansen. So Rob Hansen is a UK fan historian who's been active in fandom then since the mid-1970s. Um, and actually Rob's been a really great contributor to the exhibition that we have at uh, Bruce Castle Museum. So if you've seen the fanzines on display in the exhibition, uh, part of this has been uh, Rob's unbelievable collection of fanzines that date from the mid-1920s. 1930s. Okay, so the 1930s. Um, the other part of the fanzine collection is has been um, also uh, loaned by Pat Charnock, who's over there in the back. Um, so uh, Rob has been compiling then uh, the history of um, UK fandom, and this has been published in uh, or assembled in his publication then, A History of Science Fiction Fandom in the UK from 1930 to 1980. Um, so uh, I've actually been really lucky I've, I've spoken to Rob quite a lot and he's been feeding in a lot into our research then into the mimeograph and particularly the very close um, association with the mimeograph and um, fandom so perhaps we could uh, start Rob with if you give a, a, a kind of an introduction perhaps to, to um, fandom in the UK yeah. <coughs> yeah so science fiction you probably know what it is now, but that doesn't mean that it was always what you think it was. Um, Brian Aldiss says that Mary Shelley's, Fra Shelley's Frankenstein was the starting point. And obviously immediately after that, you then had things like um, Wells and Verne, but they were scientific romances. So by the time you get to the early 20th century, those who've read that kind of stuff and like that kind of fiction, um, new fiction of that sort is only available to them via the pulps, which the Americans are putting out, which is a lot more garish and a lot more um, low-brow, should we say, Dis disreputable. Science fiction fandom grew out of the pulps. It didn't grow out of Wells and Verne. Um, and the reason for that was because from 1926, you had amazing stories published in America, edited by Hugo Gernsback. And it did something very useful, was it printed the names and addresses of people who wrote letters to it in the back which meant that other people who saw it could then write to people in their area um, and get in touch with them. And this slowly led to correspondences, and that led to the first local science fiction groups. Um, if we're going to give science fiction fandom a birthday, science fiction fandom is 90, year old, 90 years old this year. The reason being that the very first meeting of the first fan group we're aware of took place in 1929 in Harlem, New York, America. We started a year later, so our first, the first meeting of the first fan group in this country occurred in Ilford on Monday the 27th of October 1930. It was called the Ilford Science Literary Circle. You'll observe the, word science, the term science fiction doesn't exist in it at that time, science literary. And that's because the term science fiction hadn't come to prominence yet, it still wasn't really called that. Um, so, in fact, what, it was, what they tended to call it, they, they conflated scientific and fiction, and they came up with the word scientifiction, which is what it was called at that time. So if you come across that word, you'll now know what it was. Um, so after, so that was to say, Leeds, the Ilford Science Literary Circle was our first fan group. Other fan groups followed after that in various other places. Um, the biggest at the time, too far? The biggest at the time wasn't um, London, as you might imagine, it was Leeds. And the Leeds fans put on what was the world's very first science fiction convention on the 1st of January, 1937. Now, the Americans will tell you they had the first science fiction convention. This is not true. Um, a month or two before this, yeah. a month or two before that, knowing that this was going to happen, um, a group of New York fans traveled to Philadelphia to meet a group of Philadelphia fans at one of their homes, and they said, I know, let's declare this a convention. So it was, you know, it's just a meeting, whereas the, meet, the uh, convention in Leeds, and there's a picture from that convention. There were 14 people there. That's, um, if you look on the far right of the picture, the second from the right is a very young Arthur C. Clarke. And the chap in the middle, the very tall chap, if you know your science fiction writers, is Eric Frank Russell. And on the far end, the short guy is somebody you won't have heard of, but I'll mention later, called J. Michael Rosenblum, who is quite important in the story as we progress. So these guys came together that one day. It was a one-day convention. Um, four people traveled up from um, 
London and, no, three people traveled up from London and they were joined by somebody at Nuneaton on the same train and those four traveled then up to Leeds where they met two others who traveled over from Liverpool, which was Eric Frank Russell and his friend Leslie Johnson. Um, sorry, what? Second from the right. Second from the left. My right. Uh, I'm yeah. talking my right, yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. I sh I, right of the picture. So yeah, where was I? Oh yes, yeah, so that was the first convention. Um, and in London, we also started meeting later that year, I think, was the first Thursday of the month meetings, except then it was every Thursday. So London fans, you know, fans in the capital took a bit longer to get together than fans in the provinces for some reason. Um, but they did start to meet, and we still meet on Thursdays, only now it's not every Thursday, it's the first Thursday um, to this day. In fact, it's the first Thursday now, that's where I'll be going after this meeting. Uh, pub meetings, um, as I say, have been held since then except obviously in the 1940s when World War II happened, which was a bit difficult for people to get leave to go to a pub. So that was the first convention. The second and third conventions, which are the last two prior to the war, which are 38 and 39, were held in London. They were held in the ancient order of Druids Memorial Hall. So you had all these guys talking about science fiction in the shadow of a papier-mâché Stonehenge, which is a bit incongruous. So. Um, but fandom kind of grew, um, how would you say? I suppose it, it, it grew in numbers, but it grew slowly because obviously you were starting from a very low base. Um, and in fact, people then started getting together in other ways. Like at 88 Grazing Road, there was a flat that was lived in prior to the war and indeed up till about 1940-ish by Arthur C. Clarke, Bill Temple, and Morris K. Hansen. And, um, at the time, they were the officers in both the National Science Fiction Organization, which was then called the Science Fiction Association, and the British Interplanetary Society. And the British Interplanetary Society was basically a rocket group, but there was a lot of crossover. And in fact, weirdly enough, we have the current president of the British Interplanetary Society in the audience with us at the moment. So these two groups, um, say 88 Grays in Road became the national headquarters for both groups at that point and for quite a while. Um, publications were done out of it, etc., etc., mailed out, uh, memberships and where have you, until World War II came along and they were both suspended for the duration. Now, the, um, the thing you need to know about science fiction fandom is that our fanzines, while nominally you'd think would be about science fiction, mostly aren't. Because what happened is when the early fans got together, they would talk about science fiction. But they also discovered that they were quite interested in each other. And, into the, and so they gradually developed their own kind of subculture. You see, basically, it's what goes on on the internet these days. People kind of, you know, talk to each other, et cetera, et cetera. So, we, you know, fans were doing all that kind of stuff, but they were doing it via the mail. So fanzines, for the most part, from about late 40s onwards, were primarily about fandom. So it was kind of mostly fandom with some science fiction thrown in. Um, and indeed, you, you, you'd think to yourself, well, how much of a subculture could there have grown up? Well, I found it interesting enough that I put together, that wrote this, researched and wrote this book, which is 400 pages, 300,000 words, and it goes from 1930 to 1980. So obviously, there was plenty of material there. And uh, over to you. What do you want to go next? <laughs> Great, thank you. So it was to then look a bit about how the duplicator, the mimeograph machine, contributed to fandom, in what way it sort of aided or made, made fandom possible. Yeah. So the first fanzine ever published in this country was called Nova Terra. That's the first issue over on the right there. And as you can see, they couldn't afford staples. Um, I believe, I've not actually seen a copy of that one personally, I believe it was in fact duplicated. Um, you'll see two symbols on it. Up in the top right corner, that's SFL, which stands for the Science Fiction League. And the number in the bottom, 22. That's because this was put out by the Nuneaton chapter of the Science Fiction League, and they were, they were chapter number 22. The Science Fiction League was something that Wonder Stories magazine started. Um, and quite a few early local groups in this country started out because 
people got together via the letter pages of Wonder Stories and they formed local chapters. That's how the Leeds group started as well. Over on the left, there's a much later issue. Um, by this time, Arthur C. Clarke is a co-editor. And you'll observe at the top, it doesn't say SFL, it says SFA. And that's because at the first convention in 1937, they voted en masse that rather than be chapters of this American organization, they would start their own British organization called the Science Fiction Association. Um, that's a fully duplicated uh, fanzine, as you can see. It was, they used blue ink, as I recall. No, that was black ink there, but certainly quite a few of them, they used blue ink. Uh, the artist was Harry Turner. I don't believe they had access to um, Electra stencils back then, so he probably would have done that direct on stencil, which quite a few of the early, um, early fans did. And Oscar asked me to bring along a set of fan, uh, pile of fanzines with me from just to demonstrate over the years. So there from 80 years ago is Nova, the one you see in there is Nova Terra number, number was it? 25. And that was, uh, let's say, Arthur C. Clarke co edited that. And then we've got from the Americans, if I can find it, right at the bottom, of course. From 1948, this was the 1948 Fantasy Annual. Very nice cover. That's about 100 plus pages. So people were knocking out fairly large fanzines at that time. Um, and and these, these are all produced on wax stencils? Yeah, that's a wax stencil one, yeah. The cover wasn't, I don't think. I'm fairly certain the cover was litho. Again, that's something that happens quite a bit um, in the course of the history of fanzines is because you want your cover to look nice, very often if you had something that was that intricate, you pay the extra for a litho cover even though the ins insides would be duplicated. And then we have Femazine, which was an all-female fanzine that was done in the mid-1950s. Female fans decided to get together and, and put that out. Hyphen, which is put out in Northern Ireland. Um, Bob Shaw, the SF writer, was involved, so was Walt Willis. Um, that's generally regarded as one of the best fanzines in terms of being the most entertaining ever done. What also happened in the 1950s, people stopped charging for fanzines. What actually happened was because we're hobbyists, we're not doing this to make a living or, or try to uh, go any further. We, people just said this was sunk cost. It's the same as if you were being, I don't know, uh, you're an angler. You'd pay for your rods and that, and you wouldn't think any about it, anything about it. So people did fanzines, and fanzines then became available for what we call the usual. And the usual means letter of comment, fanzine in trade, or contribution. So um, you know, that was obviously a very important um, development. And then, what have we, oh yes. Moving through to the 1980s, that was one, um, put out of Liverpool, as you can see, obviously using really cheap ink because the ink is separated and you've got a halo of oil all around it. And that's covered by Jim Cawthorn, who was a big friend of uh, Michael Moorcox. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, so for me it was uh, thinking a bit about then the, the, the role that the duplicator, play, for instance, why the duplicator and also uh, were there other print mediums that were used then by fans because it's obviously such a long period of history. Yeah. Fans basically use whatever they could get hold of. If you had a spirit duplicator, you'd put out spirit duplicated fan, fanzines. I have some from the 40s that are still legible, but as was mentioned by an earlier speaker, um, you put them in the light for any length of time and they fade away. So they're kept in darkness. I really ought to get around to scanning them one of these days so they, you know, we know they survive. Um, but as I say, people would use whatever they could. The um, hyphen was the second fanzine put up by the Belfast boys. The first one they put out was called Slant, which started in 1948. And they somehow got hold of a flatbed letter press. So it was um, one of those things where you have the metal, um, what would you call them? Metal kind of gutters that you, you slide individual letters in, and you slide in the, the gaps, and then you, letter, you put each press. line in turn into this flatbed and jam them all up, and then you, you put an ink roller across, do your individual pages, and then you start the procedure all over again for the next one. So this was labor intensive like you wouldn't believe. And the, um, the covers were all lino cut. So somebody would cut bits of lino and, and they were obviously lots of blacks. So they say people use whatever they get hold of. So what was interesting when uh, I've spoken to you previously is um, uh, that the machines are generally shared 
So one, one um, if you could say a few words then about uh, how, how that would work. I know also you, you mentioned previously later on then when you were producing your uh, zines using yeah, well, sharing the electric stencils, but also then in relation to the sharing of the machines, because they often have these amazing histories. And often um, you, you mentioned too the link between um, fandom and the peace movement and fans also duplicating uh, well, for the peace they're movement. They're slightly separate issues, but in terms of um, if you had a, f um, a duplicator then, and you were in a local group, you would obviously do your own fanzines and you'd very often run them off for other people as well. Um, back in the early 1980s, in the arctic conditions of my <laughs> unheated kitchen, which is where I kept my duplicator back then, um, I spent many a winter's night, as it were, running off fanzines for other people. You know, then obviously they'd come over. It wasn't me sitting, you know, standing there doing it. Um, one of them was a chap named Malcolm Edwards, who's now a fairly big wig in British publishing. As for pacifism, it's, I don't quite know why this has happened, but over the decades, British fans have always got involved in the um, peace movements of their day. So in the 1940s, that chap there is J. Michael Rosenblum, who was the short chap we saw on the end of the um, line of people at the first convention. He was a conscientious objector. And during World War II, um, in between doing, working in the field and fire watching, he put out a fanzine called Futurium War Digest, and that's, that's a cover of it then. And this was the fanzine that kept British fandom more or less together during World War II. Because most fans, being the age they were, were conscripted and they were off fighting in the European theatre or they were fighting in, in um, the Far East or what have you. Um, so they still want, you know, even though they're soldiers and they're at war, they still wanted to keep in touch with other fellow fans. And so Mike Rosenblum put out this fanzine and that Future in War Digest. And it wasn't just a fanzine in and of itself. It, it had riders with it, so if, if an individual fan somewhere managed to get hold of some army gear and knock out a short run of, um, of a, a single sheeter or something, he would send it to Rosenblum. Rosenblum would kind of bind it with the, the next Future in War Digest and that would then go out to everybody. So he more or less kept us going during World War II. However, with regard to pacifism, um, he also got in trouble with the authorities at one point because in the second issue of Futurian War Digest, he wrote a fairly scathing piece about the uh, treatment of some, pe some people who were going up for conscientious objector um, status at the hands of people in the army, etc. The authorities got wind of this and he was almost charged with put publishing seditious material, so he had to be a bit careful after that. And the other thing it was that he wasn't the only conscientious objector. There, there was quite a few um, major fans before the war became conscientious objectors during the war, although the vast majority went away and fought, etc., etc. And the interesting thing is, there was no um, problem among those serving with those who were conscientious objectors. When they came home on leave, they would socialize and all the rest of it. So it wasn't any kind of... Um, they weren't looked at, down upon for it at all. In fact, I've got any number of photographs from World War II of Mike... Uh, Sorry, Mike Rosenblum hosting, you know, fans in uniform. So, yeah, that was what happened there. And if we want the next slide, please. Obviously, the next thing that happens then is in the fifth, late 50s, we get CND. Now, um, fans of the time got fairly heavily involved in CND. If you look at the top picture there, you'll observe that the woman, who was Joan Hammett, who was in charge of Midland area CND, I believe, at the time, um, she's wearing a little CND badge, and the chap behind her is her husband, Dr. Paul Hammett. That was taken at the 1959 EasterCon, which is our National Science Fiction Convention. And the reason they have coats on is because they were just about to leave to join the march from Aldermaston to London which is the second march. The first march, as you all know, was the other way around. They marched from London to Aldermaster. Um, John Brunner, who is another fan stroke SF writer, he wrote the CND song, etc. And then the bottom picture then, that's Easter 1960, and that's people, that year the, SF, the National Convention was held in London, which is fairly unusual because uh, of the price. 
um, and the hotel was in, within walking distance of Trafalgar Square. So that's a photograph of, on the Monday, Easter Monday, obviously very sunny, of people sitting on the stairs of St. Martin's in the field waiting for the Aldermaston marches to show up, and those are fans of the time. And you'll, again, you'll observe that uh, the chap on the f far right, a guy named Jim Linwood, is wearing a CND badge. Next to him is a beardless Michael Moorcock. So, um, this, you know, so again, they were really into it at the time. They did, however, have an American visitor with them, a guy called Don Ford, who was very kind of, ooh, what's all this? He kind of went with them to watch them come back. He was not happy about this at all. <laughs> so, so, yeah, um, that's what happened. And obviously, you see, they kept involved with it, went on the marches, etc., etc. Next one, please. Then we come to the 1980s. Again, CND revival at that time. Fans of the day got involved in it all. Um, we have a um, picture there on the far right. That's an American. In fact, it's my wife, although she wasn't my wife then, standing in front of the Embarrassed Americans Against Reagan banner. And this was June 9th, 1984, one of the marches we went on back then. Uh, I, was, I was not personally a member of CND, neither was my wife, but there were various fans who were. A friend of ours, Joseph Nicholas, he, um, he and his wife uh, did the publications, again, fans doing publications because they knew how to put out fanzines, for Pimlico CND, and they put out um, Ground Zero News. Um, and the guy on the far right is Malcolm Edwards. And Malcolm told me a story a while back I hadn't heard, which made me laugh, which was that he was a member at the time, because he's in publishing, of a publisher's group that was um, a CND type publisher's group. And they were standing around thinking, oh, we've got, we've got to put out a publication. And he said, it was unbelievable. He said, I was there with all these kind of big wigs in British publishing. He said, none of them knew how to put a four page you know, leaflet. He said, oh, leave it to me, because of course he'd done fanzine. So he then knocked out the four page leaflet that none of these big wigs in British publishing knew how to do. And so, uh, yeah, oh, the other thing that happened in the 1980s was the British Science Fiction Association used to have a monthly meeting over a, in a room above a pub called the King of Diamonds, which I used to go along to. And because it was the early 90s and people just talk about what's going on, Needless to say, because quite a few people were in CND and they were talking about upcoming marches, et cetera, et cetera, the conversation would very often turn to that. And eventually the pub landlord ejected us. He said, I'm not having you here, he said. I said, I thought you were a science fiction group. He said, you're all these bloody you know, CND guys. So we got kicked out of the pub over that. Is he going to wondering if you could speak also a little bit about, um, uh, for one, for something that's interesting for us is how the machines enabled these networks. And we see it, we'll see it a bit tomorrow, we're talking about Bojess Press and how they created these artist networks. And obviously the, those, those, um, those networks were also aimed at um, trying to uh, exist outside of traditional networks. And so if you could speak a little bit maybe about um, fandom and how the duplicators aided um, fan networks and established fan networks. In this, I assume you mean in terms of fandom being international? Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, in the English-speaking world, you tended to send your fanzines out to people in Australia, Canada, America, yada, yada, yada. So what that meant was that we then got to know each other. Um, and, of course, the, that you ended up then visiting each other's conventions, etc., and what have you. And there were various fan funds organized. In fact, I was the recipient of one of them called the Transatlantic Fan Fund, which amuses people because I'm Welsh, and obviously that's tough. But anyway, so um, what this meant was that people voting kind of pay uh, their voting fee and people then vote on the various candidates who, who are kind of nominated. And that per the person who wins then travels across to um, either the US or the opposite direction to here. And, you, you know, these, you then are in charge of organizing the next race, which is actually a good idea. And it's hoped that you will publish a report on it, which I did, but it's not actually a, a requirement as such. So, yeah. Okay, and I was also thinking about just yeah, the use of the postal system and um, also as well as physically going to cons, uh, being able to, uh, to create these network links, say, with the US and the UK um, through the postal system. Well, again, yeah, that's, that's kind of the only thing we had to do, because we could, given that there wasn't the internet. So in a sense, what we were doing, a lot, a lot of the social interaction was the type of thing that people were doing late, late, later on the internet anyway, but they were doing it we were doing it using the postal service rather than electronic communication. So this made, this made flame wars a lot slower 
because you, you know, somebody would say something awful and you send it across the Atlantic to somebody else, you know, and three days later you get a response, you go, what? And you send it, so yes, they were very, very slow as opposed to these things that burn out within hours sometimes on the internet. Um, and certain forms were the same as well in that although you'd have fanzines you would send out to lots of people, general fanzines, there were also closed groups called amateur press associations. In other words, where you'd have a limited number and you'd only send the fanzines out to the people within that group. You know, they, you'd send your fanzines in, they would be collated and then resend out to the people in that group. And so, you know, you'd get conversations started that way. And they, this is pretty, pretty much the same as a Yahoo group, in essence, but on paper. And so in regards to cost then, so obviously the, the, possibly then the postal, the yeah. postage cost were... Postage was uh, always the big bugger, because you, you would... Um, you would, you, you would happily eat the cost of the fanzines, but posts kept going up, and it, so you, have, you kept trying to find ways around this. So it became the norm to distribute, to do a fanzine immediately before a fan, uh, fanzine immediately before a convention, so you could get it out, um, hand it out to people. Um, yeah. Put it again. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to speak a little bit about then the link between uh, fandom and counterculture. Well, cult yeah, culture generally. Oops. Now, fandom and popular culture, this is kind of interesting to some extent, in that back in the 1950s, this is a fanzine called The Jazz Fan. It was put out by the teenage Michael Moorcock, who later became a writer, yada, yada, yada. And his art editor was a chap called Bill Harry. Now, that's a picture of Bill Harry up at the top there, at the 1957 convention, surrounded by, um, surrounded by fanzines and magazines. Bill Harry then went on to, um, he was a Liverpool fan, he then went on to art school where he met somebody called Stuart Sutcliffe, who introduced him to his friend John Lennon. And because Bill had been putting out fanzines, he put out a fanzine called Biped, etc. He had the idea, because there was this interesting music scene going on, that he would finance and put out this magazine called Mersey Beat. In fact, that's the first issue there. And uh, in the early days, the Beatles, because remember, a little local band, they weren't you know, international then, uh, they'd come along and uh, they'd help him collate it. And uh, John Lennon wrote poet, poems for it under beat coma, that's where they first appeared, etc. So you certainly had that link. Um, so that's a fairly, fairly big one. And then, what else have we got? Oh yes, L. Ron Hubbard, <laughs> father of Scientology. He showed up out of the blue at the 1953 convention, just walked in off the street. And because he'd been an SF author prior to becoming a cult leader, um, he kind of spoke at the convention, but that was, that was one of the stranger things. And he was, um, I think that was the very last time he appeared at a convention. Um, <clears throat> SF science fiction was noti noticed to some extent by literary figures as well, with the result that in the early 1960s, both Edmund Crispin and Kingsley Amis were guests of honor at science fiction conventions. Strange, but true. Um, oh, yes. <clears throat> Stieg Larsson, does that name mean anything to anybody here? He's the author of the um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo books. He was a Swedish fan. Um, <clears throat> in the early 70s, he was, I think, based in Malmo, which I think is in the north of Sweden. So, oh, okay, south, I've just been corrected. Um, but a fair old distance from Stockholm, anyway. And his local group, he started a local fan group, um, and they put out fanzines, etc., etc. And they attracted the attention of um, some young fan who turned out to be basically a prototype Nazi. So Larson thought, this is strange. Didn't we, didn't we defeat the Nazis like many, many years ago? So I think this is where he, start, he first became interested in the idea that we hadn't, put, you know, we hadn't finished with the Nazis at all, that we've got to be careful, yada, yada, yada. Uh, he moved to, with his girlfriend, he moved to Sweden, and they then, he then eventually ended up being, running the Swedish Science Fiction Association. I have no idea what it was called, but in the, in the national organization. But he also, again, I assume because of um, his experience with these, uh, this, this chap in Malmo, he then got interested in anti-fascist activity, and he, he kept warning uh, lo, you know, um, people in Sweden about this, and, they poo-pooed him, this is in the past, but he kind of then started reporting pseudonymously. He was the Swedish reporter for Searchlight magazine over here, which as you probably know, keeps, keeps an eye on fascists in this country. Um, and then obviously he went on to write the Dragon Tattoo books. They've recently put together a book about his life, um, asked for various contributors, 
and John Henry Holmberg, who's a Swedish fan who knew him, wrote a chapter basically laying out all this stuff about you know, his, uh, the science fiction uh, connection, which they decided was irrelevant and left out. So there you go. Um, it's recently appeared in a fanzine, but that's typical. They always assume, well, this is obviously nothing to do with anything serious. So yeah, that was Steve Glasson. Uh, oh, yes. <clears throat> the term, we call them fanzines now, but they weren't always called fanzines. When Nova Terra came out, it was a fan mag because that was the contraction of, of fan magazine that was used then. The term fanzine came into existence in 1940 when it was coined by a man called Louis Russell Chauvenet, an American fan, within the pages of, um, I think his fanzine was called Detours. And that's the term that gradually took over and we've used it every, ever since and everybody in every other fan, fandom uses it. But yeah, that was the guy responsible, you know, Louis Russell Chauvenet, he coined that term. So. I was wondering how are we doing with time? Okay, great. So, um, I thought that it would be great to, uh, w one of the ways that we learn then about how people were using duplicators to produce artwork is, has been through the factory. So the factory producing these in-house magazines and these kind of how-to guides, which are, uh, the, the publication that they produce is really beautiful. Uh, and another one has been then uh, through Rob introducing us to various fanzines uh, that were about sort of sharing the technical knowledge about how to duplicate, uh, both of which have really fascinating um, histories, as well as how um, innovative fans were for um, sort of bypassing perhaps a lot of the Gestetna made uh, tools and producing their own. So if you wouldn't mind giving a bit of background, maybe um, two of the publications that we have in the exhibition, one is called Duplicating Without Tears, and then um, uh, I think um, slightly later, Duplicating Notes. Yeah, Duplicating Without Tears was put out by a chap called Vince Clark in 1954, I think, because at the time in the 1950s, we're talking about a period of austerity. Nobody had much money, so therefore, they, did, they didn't necessarily want to stump up the cost of buying the proper gear. So, in terms of doing art on stencil, rather than use styluses, they'd very often use a dead burrow, because again, you'd use the roller and that'd be quite decent. And um, they made bootleg, um, what do you call those things? Wheel, wheel pens. pens. Wheel pens, yeah. By taking bits out of a watch and putting um, a, uh, a paper clip through it, and then heat sealing the end, yeah, heat sealing the end in, um, in, a, in a burrow. Also, yeah. Also, when you transfer art to a stencil, or you draw on it directly, usually you have to have a light shining through the back. And there was a thing called um, a mimeoscope for doing this. It was basically like an A-frame, and you'd have a, a sheet of glass, you'd have a light behind it shining into it, and you'd, put, you'd clamp your, um, your stencil on to the front, and you know, so you, you tape your artwork onto the glass, the light would shine through your art, artwork, you'd clamp your stencil, and then you'd trace it. Um, fans got around this in terms of not, being, not wanting to buy the original thing, by buying a sheet of glass, going to Woolworths, buying a socket for, a, for um, a, a lamp, getting bits of an old chair, and sticking the lot together, and they make these homemade uh, mimeoscopes, and they work just fine. So yeah, a lot of it, again, was lack of money, so they just, used, they just did what they could with what they had. I think you really can't appreciate enough the, the level of skill that goes into, I don't know how many people have worked with this process, wax stencils, but basically the, 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 the wheel pen, and so this is something that, like a technique that we like to use, it's uh, literally then a pen with a, a little revolving wheel that's got um, uh, little ledges so you can see it as it's going around. And so it's producing then in the wax stencil then a series actually of uh, holes, and it's through those holes that the ink passes through. And actually, when you look at the publication, then often it looks like a line. But actually, when you look closely, it's a series of, of holes. Here's, we look at it now and we think, my God, yeah. uh, what, a, what an effort. But Here's it's, the, it's the fanzines that you yeah. can really appreciate, the, 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 like the technical skill that went into it and the, the level that they managed to achieve uh, in these zines. Here's a stencil from the 1950s that was never run off for some reason. And there's a hand, hand stencil piece of artwork on it. So that's the kind of level of thing that they would do there. Um, so yeah, obviously I'll never be running that off now because it's the last, last one I'm aware of, you know, and run off in that period. 
this was the problem with um, Electra stencils, was that they were great for big areas of black, but the more you burn through them, the weaker they get. So therefore, you're fine with text. Um, I've never actually worked out what the maximum number of, of copies you can run off a typed wax stencil is, but it has to be several hundred before it starts to crinkle and... 4,000, I stand corrected, 4,000 apparently. But if you've weakened it by, by, putting, by cutting artwork into it, then it's probably fewer. I've certainly torn um, Electro stencils before now. I think it probably, well, it depends on the, the, the amount of, the amount of uh, work that's gone into the stencil, I think, if it's, if it's just got a little bit of text, it probably could produce quite a lot. I yeah. think the, the Spies for Peace um, pamphlet, which we've got in the exhibition as well, they said that they, the maximum that they managed to produce, I think, was 3,000. Um, and then I think the Gestetner literature often says you could do 5,000 with a stencil. So maybe it's a test. We should probably we'll, we'll run a test ah. and see. Yeah. No SF fan knew that because none of us ever ran off 5,000 copies of a fanzine. Uh, generally speaking, they were in the, again, because we're giving them away, usually they were in the hundreds. So I suspect most fanzines ran from, say, 50 to 300, that, that kind of range, something like that. I think it's uh, worth just like the, the I love the the, um, the history of fandom and this sharing knowledge because this the duplicating without tears you know partly it underscores the process that it's not such an easy it's not always yeah. such an easy easy forgiving process it takes a lot of time and effort um, yes but it's often your uh, when when your um, when Oscar first contacted me and I mentioned that cutting stencils you have to um, decouple the tape. You didn't know that at the time, did you? You'd, you'd actually tried cutting stencils with the ribbon still in. And initially when we would type, yeah. we weren't aware that, that, that um, a typewriter had then three, three gauges yeah. and then you can put it on white, uh, which, which runs for a stencil. And so then it was a matter of pressing often yeah. three letters, a, a letter yeah. three times yeah. in order to produce text. So at the beginning we were thinking there's a problem with the stencil before we <laughs> no. realised that. It's, the fact that we need to remove the ribbon. Yeah, the thing you have to remember is because these were business, business machines, they were integrated with other business machines. So typewriters at the time always had a lever on the side, and it was usually black, white, red, because usually you'd, have to, uh, you'd very often have a tape that was a black and a red. And the middle set in the white just disengaged it. And the whole reason for that was so you could start type stencils. Because that was part of a secretary's job back then, was you know, if you wanted to run stuff off, she had to type the stencils. So, oh, and um, one, in terms of consumables, I brought along, I still got a bottle of correction fluid, stencil correction fluid, and I brought it along to show Oscar to say, look, I said, this is what they sell, but I, I opened it and I said, smell it. And I then put a bit down, I said, this is nail varnish. If you used, I said, you know, you, given that you can't get this stuff anymore, just buy some cheap nail varnish from a pound store, you might have to f mess around with diluting it and that. There's just correction fluid, because I would imagine getting correction fluid these days is probably impossible. And that um, actually passes on quite nicely because Pat Charnock organises a, a conference uh, called Corflu. Do we do we do we call it a conference? A convention. So um, a convention called Corflu, and obviously that's the short terminology for correction fluid. So then that also kind of underscores then uh, the close connection that with uh, the duplicator, the Gestetner, yeah. the mimeograph, and um, and fan law. Yep. There's the program book for the very first call flu, which was actually held in California in 1984. Um, very nice cover, except the person has drawn a litho machine for some reason rather than a duplicator. But, so there you go. You talked, about, you, talked about the covers having, you talked about the covers being by a different process, but there was, from the 30s, there was a photographic stencil. So, ah. so you could, so you, you could do a photographic stencil for the cover. Right, I was unaware of that. Um, again, because you get used to the fact that there's certain limitations. If, um, actually, if, if you scroll through a couple to the one, the Epsilon covers. Ah, there we go. Oh, there's. So these are Rob's own fanzines. But again, there's only three of them, one's missing. Oh well, that, I was gonna, um, Oscar was asking me about why, what, what, why you chose to do certain things certain ways. Um, the old black cover hasn't shown up for some reason. There was one that was, you know, it was all light and shadow. So these ones were done because I knew they were going to be uh, electro stenciled, or, you know, or rather they were going to be run off on my duplicator. I didn't want large areas of black. So if you scroll down, 
Oh, okay, whatever. There's, um, so the one in the right, top right-hand corner and the bottom one, um, they're kind of self-portraits. Yes, I used to have hair 35 years ago. Um, but they were done fairly simple um, line drawings. The only real black area there is the hair. And you'll observe as well that the iconography of the duplicator, we don't, you know, the number of, of um, fanzines that have pictures of duplicators on them is, is quite a lot. Uh, in the case of Epsilon 11 there, <clears throat> I did the pencils on that and gave it to a friend of mine called Harry Bell to do the inks, and he's done a lot of stippling there. So again, you can see by the, the fact that it didn't come out totally even. You, you can see kind of um, light and dark areas. Again, that could be a problem if you weren't very careful with uh, running it through. And th again, that maybe underscores a bit to the um, not using traditional um, duplicating methods. So normally you'd use a shading plate with the wax stencils, but there you're kind of adapting the process a bit. To yeah. I've I personally never drawn directly on stencil. I've always done a drawing, then I had it electro stenciled. So, or alternately, lithoed. Yeah. So then to, to the, the reason why you would incorporate then, say, the duplicators within your own work and also how um, other fanzines incorporate the duplicator. Okay. Could you go back? Backwards. Right. The, um, right. the enchanted duplicator. Again, you'll observe picture of a duplicator, but not just a picture, a whole, um, what would you call it? allegorical fable, should we say. It was done in the style of um, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, and it was basically an allegorical fable of somebody finding their way through fandom, and, he, and he's searching for the enchanted duplicator, and there's all these obstacles on the way, and eventually he finds the enchanted duplicator, and it's, it's beaten up, it's this beaten up ratty old duplicator, and he says, this is the enchanted duplicator? And then he turns it, and lo and behold, magic happens. And the, the whole thing is, is that the enchanted duplicator is the one with a true fan at the handle. So in other words, it doesn't matter about the state of it. It's just the love you put into it and what you produce from it. So you're, you as a fan, you, or anyone producing a publication, then you, you sit there, you, you crank out then your uh, pages, and then you've got to go through the, the long process of collating. Yeah. Yes. No, I said we're slightly out of order here, but let's go. Next one. Now, yes, collating. This is, as you can tell by the, uh, the stylish attire, is the 1950s, I think mid 1950s. The guy with the cigarette in his mouth in the top picture is a guy called Archie Mercer, and the chap at the duplicator, which looks like a 200 series, is a guy called, well done, 260, a guy called Terry Jeeves. Um, wearing the latest in uh, audio equipment as well, as you can see. Not exactly beats from Dr. Dre, but there you go, I'm sure it was. Uh, so he's listening to jazz rather than the thrum of the duplicator, which I like the sound of a duplicator personally, but anyway. So yeah, he's running it off and Archie is getting the pages. Now scroll up to the next picture. Here you see people, and this was, this was the approved method of, of doing collating if you, could, if you had the room to do it, which is <clears throat> you would put the, the pages in a circle around the table, and then people would walk in a circle around the table, picking them up, and putting them there, and it was a very quick way of doing it. However, the guy picking it up there, Sandy Sanderson, is doing it wrong, and I will explain why. It's because, it's because as you pick a page up, you should put it in your hand like that, right? And the reason for that is every time you do it and put it in your hand, you can then see whether the other side is duplicated or not. Because it happens, you know, not infrequently, it happens uh, occasionally that you'll get a page through and a page will be picked up, the other side hasn't been printed. So always pick it up, turn it into your hand. Otherwise, you send out fanzines and people are reading them happily, and all of a sudden, blank page. Uh, so, yeah. I think collating parties is a great solution to... Uh... Yeah, I mean, we, well, we... We, we tended to call them collating sessions in this country because we didn't do what they did in the States. They'd have collating parties where somebody would invite over the rest of the group and they'd put on a big bowl of chili and kind of crisps and you know, uh, soda and make a big party of it. We were a bit parsimonious and we just invite people over, maybe a few beers and you know, after you'd finished working away at it. When I was doing my own fans, you know, and I was living in a flat by myself, I tended to do my own collating. So I would squat cross-legged on the floor, and I would have a horseshoe semicircle around me, uh, one internal one and one external one. So you're doing, da -da 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 -da. this is fine, except after several hours of doing it, you get a really sore back from swiveling, so yeah. <laughs>
Uh, so we're going to say a, a few words maybe about some significant some uh, fanzines that come to mind, duplicated, mimeoed fanzines that you would uh, point out. Well, I mean, there have been lots of um, people over the years. Of, uh, some of the, I mean, there's fantastic fanzines at the exhibition. Uh, there's, and yeah. um, it, art, in terms of the artistic level and what you're able to produce then with these wax stencils, it's the Stella magazines that I always think of. <clears throat> yes, yeah, Stella was a fanzine put out in the mid-50s by Ted White, who later became an editor of various uh, American um, SF magazines. And he, at one point, really got into doing multicolored covers. So um, he, you have to get your, you either have to get your registration right, or you have it such that the, the, the colors don't have to closely register. And he did some very nice work. And as, you, as, as Oscar says, if you go along to the exhibition, you'll be able to see them there. Uh, in terms of significant fans, any number of science fiction writers started out as SF fans, doing fanzines first. You have Christopher Priest, Michael Moorcock, Ken Bulmer, Arthur C. Clarke, E.C. Tubb, etc., etc. So uh, Bill Gibson, who went on to, William Gibson went on to do, uh, you know, the new, new romance and stuff. So I don't know to what extent it happens anymore because I don't know to what extent they do that anymore. But anyway, yes, because in the early days, the SF fan, uh, the SF pro-fan community was quite tightly knit because it was so small. So when you went along to the first Thursday meeting, you would see all the local professional writers there, as well as the local fans. Very often, uh, Ted Carnell, who was the editor of New Worlds, he would show up with the galleys and the cover art, etc., and show it around the pub before, you know, take, going away and the professional magazine being printed. This does not happen anymore. We don't get pros showing up at all anymore. Um, so should we maybe open up some questions, if anyone has any um, questions for Rob? Did fans generally enjoy the process of d d using these machines, or did they find it a barrier to actually getting their ideas out? You know, was the photocopier a revelation for people because it allowed it to make it so much easier? Uh, not at first. The, po the main problem with the early photocopiers was they wouldn't do large areas of black, so you'd get these bleached out images. Um, plus the fact they were weirdly sticky. You know, the ink, I don't know they quite got it all sorted out. So I know what you're saying this, it's because there was gradually a shift from the duplicator to uh, photocopying. I mean, when I bought my first duplicator in 1980, they were, all always, they were already obsolete, more or less, as business machines. Mr. Kostetner is disagreeing with me, I'll about to disagree with that. But all right, the model that I bought was obviously obsolete, so, um, but, but so therefore I was able to get it relatively inexpensive. But, but so the, the very first um, Xerox machine, sorry, the very first photocopied fanzines I recall seeing were kind of in the 70s, but they say they tended to have this bleached out uh, art, and then gradually as we move from the 70s through the 80s, there was a gradual shift from the duplicator to the photocopier, and by the end of the uh, by the end of the 80s, there was only a few of us diehards that were still producing fanzines on duplicators. But in terms of the barrier to producing content, was that the editorial side of it coming out with the articles and the art, or was it the actual mechanics of going through the duplication process was the issue? Well, I mean, I've done both, and I never didn't find a lot of difference in terms of getting stuff done, other than I had a duplicator in my in my home, and therefore, if I wanted to put out a fanzine, and I decided, oh, I'll put out a fanzine, I could roll a stencil into the typewriter, type it, print it off, and the next day, send it out. If I wanted to do one with a photocopier, I did not have a photocopier, because while people might have them now, the early ones, as you may recall, were very big, very expensive machines. So in actual fact, it was easier at first to use a duplicator than it was to use a photocopier in terms of convenience. But in terms of the time, how much time is in the, in the editorial side of it, writing the copy, and how much is the production side oh, of it? Oh, right. Um, that depends on the individual. Some people can write really fast, some can't. So, uh, pass. I mean, basically, it, down to the individual. Yeah. Very expensive machines. Plus, the, you know... It's, uh, photocopying, just for everybody, is, is ten times as expensive as, as, as duplicating. And that was always one of the reasons why one wouldn't use it for long, for long runs. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. 
Before um, I pass to somebody else, this slide has come up and I haven't explained what it is. Um, those are three um, websites of some interest to you maybe. The top one, taf.org, is where there are, set, there are collections of fan writing that have been put together, assembled as um, free e-books. To be, you know, which, so one of which is the one shown there, fanzines in theory and in practice. Um, the writer of that, D. West, took this all very seriously, and to be fair, was an extremely good writer. So um, there's a lot of theory there about you know, the practice of fanzines. The middle one is my website, where there are lots of photographs from early conventions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the final one, efanzines.com, is where the vast majority of SF fanzines appear these days because um, not that many people are doing print fanzines anymore, but it doesn't mean they're doing, we're doing fewer fanzines. It's, they're putting them together as PDFs, and they're being put online primarily at efanzines.com. So you, every week there are more fanzines up there. So that's what those three are, just so you know. Any more questions? Just a quick question. How much would a couple hundred fanzines cost you um, when you made them? I don't know, because we tended, to buy, we tended to buy paper in bulk. And you'd buy a couple of choirs of fanzines. So I never ever worked out the price, frankly. I, just, I would buy the bulk when I bought it and then use it until it ran out. Uh, sorry? Uh, let's see, we're talking the 80s. Depending on a bulk buy, I remember buying, what was it, 20, no more than that. I'm trying to think how much a ream of paper was, but I can't remember. I remember I used to buy, I remember, I remember once paying over 100, giving over 100 pounds to somebody and getting huge piles of paper and ink and stencils. You know, so. Five hundred sheets of duplicating paper was fifteen shillings and sixpence, which is actually quite a lot of money. Actually, back then in, 70, in the seventies, fifteen bob was quite a lot. Um, okay, and following on from that, if you had a duplicator, how much would a duplicator cost you? More important than the cost of paper. I actually have with me um, a price list, no, a, a quotation that was given to somebody in the mid 70s for a 400 series duplicator. Um, I'm sure Mr. Gestetner knows what the prices actually were, but this, they were quoting this chap at the time about just short of 600 quid. <laughs> but in, um. in, in terms of me buying one, my, my first duplicator, I bought it from um, a second-hand shop, but it was new. It had never been used because it was obviously being considered obsolete and somebody had got rid of it. So I picked mine up for about 80 quid, I think. So, and obviously Oscar's ones, we just give, people are giving, to him, giving them to him when they can find them. Yeah, actually I read uh, there is an article about the communication company from uh, Los Angeles. Sorry? There is an article. Uh, about the communication company right. from Los Angeles that were like a crazy bunch that did wonderful things. And apparently they sold everything they had or something like that to buy a Gestetner 366. And I think that that was 4,000 US dollars, right. which is a lot of money. Oh, yeah. That's what they said. In the, again, the 60s, beginning of the 60s. A lot of money. It's a shame in a way it's dead technology because again, should you ever want to do a Samizdat stuff and not be found, this is really useful technology with which to do it. Because modern technology, they can trace you. I have a question, sorry, it's not a duplicated question really, but you mentioned a number of fans who turned pro. Um, what's the link between Noviteri, the fanzine, and New Worlds, the professional science fiction magazine? It's kind of the, uh, the ancestor of it, because as you'll observe on the second one, it says New Worlds underneath, because Noviteri, yeah. Um, the way it worked is that Noviteri was, um, it eventually became the, 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 the um, official magazine of the Science Fiction Association. When the guy who was actually publishing it at the time, Morris K. Hansen, got fed up at doing it, um, Ted, E.J. Carnell, Carnell, Ted Carnell, took, took it over from him, and he decided that rather than use the, the Latin name, he would use New Worlds. So he then put out four issues of a fanzine called New Worlds. And that was pre-war, the war came along, that was that. After the war, when he wanted to start 
a professional magazine, because he has still had the rights to the name and liked the name, he used the name New Worlds for the professional magazine. So yeah, there is a, there is a direct link. So the, it, it's kind of an ancestor. Hi, uh, I just want to ask you a question about the paper, uh, just about the paper size. Um, the first uh, fanzine you showed there was smaller than no yeah. better than the other ones. And, and were they always uh, kind of A4 size or did that no. vary? No, the very first one you saw there was full scap folded in half. I was going to say because yeah. the stencils are full scap. Because size. the two sizes we had in this country were full scap and quarter. Um, the one favoured by fans was quarter because it's kind of nice. Because again, as you say, you have to fold the other one in half and you don't get as much print on the page. In fact, when uh, A4 eventually came along, kind of in the 70s, and it, it took over from everything, those of us diehards bought up all the quarter we could so that we could carry on putting out quarter of fanzines and, you know, until we ran out of it. And in fact, I didn't run out of it. I eventually ended up giving ream after ream of quarter duplicating paper to Oscar. So he has this odd size now that, you know. Okay. It's really, the, the small one's lovely, lovely size. Well, yeah, I, I always thought the quarter was a lot more aesthetically pleasing than, than um, A4. A4 is very useful, and every time you fold it down, it's the same proportions. You know, the Germans very scientifically work this out, and yeah. it, it's, it does work, but you know, it's just not as aesthetically pleasing. And yeah, the Americans have got that's yeah. So there's British quarter. There's what we call American quarter. I'm not quite sure what they call it. As you can see, American size is slightly bigger. Again, quite a, quite an attractive size, but you know, so. It's, all, it's the paper sizes, but it's also the colours I always find fascinating. But today we use so much white paper. Yeah. But the, with the fanzines and in general duplicating paper, often it being in this kind of gold or, or yeah. blue or pink. That's because the general opinion of people was that black on white was a bit too severe and garish. So therefore, if you did it on a coloured paper, it was softer. Uh, my own fanzines, as you will have observed, I tended to use white for the cover for the artwork, and I always used colour color paper inside. So, but again, you sometimes have multicolored um, paper inside because people are just using up what they've got left. And um, L. Ron Hubbard at the Scientology Center in St. Hill, he would, in, he would, during the night, would be typing out all his thoughts and dreams and whatever. Um, and uh, first thing in the morning, the duplicating department there would duplicate um, the, the bulletin from Ron on goldenrod paper, an old gold paper right. in red ink. And this was, this was fixed like that because then, then people knew that if they saw something on the goldenrod paper yeah. in red ah. ink, they knew it was Ron's words. And very important. Gold, gold was generally the colour paper that we thought looked best with black print. So, you know, you'll see quite a lot of fanzines on old gold paper. I've got a feeling it was slightly more expensive, but I can't, I'm, that might be a false memory, I'm not sure. No, the, the tinted papers would have been more expensive, yeah. yeah. But I'm talking back to that thing about uh, someone talking about w what was it like to use the machines, etc. There is, a, a, I find, a kind of physicality uh, when you use both typewriters and um, a duplicating machine. There, you, 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 your brain is going through your body onto the machine and then you have the piece of paper at the end. That's a, that kind of is almost a mystical experience. I'm, I'm over-egging it, but it is I, a I wouldn't quite go that far, I'm <laughs> right. But yeah. The, Yeah, I like the sound, again, because it's not overpowering. I mean, if you were in a proper printing, newspaper printing plant, it would be deafening. But a, a, you know, a Gestetner duplicator isn't. It's actually quite a pleasant sound. Yeah. Which I'm kind of quite surprised there was that picture of Terry Jews with the headphones on. Okay. He obviously preferred jazz to the sound of uh, a duplicator. But talking, talking of the typewriters, you were talking about, um, Oscar, you having to discover that setting where there's a, a white spot so that the ribbon doesn't come up. That was also, you, you also use that setting if you were using Tipex to correct an almost, yeah. an already just ordinary typewriting, that way the ribbon wouldn't get yeah. in the way. Yeah, because you'd have to, you'd, you'd wind the page back up, put the Tipex on and down, yeah, that's right. Oh, I've forgotten Tipex sheets. Yes. Um, All this old technology. I can say something about this. When you were distributing the magazines, um, uh -huh. when you were posting them out, I think that there was a preferential rate on there the was, postage. Yeah, printed paper rate. I don't yeah. know whether it still applies. And, uh, and no, apparently it doesn't still apply. I've been told. <clears throat> you could just put a little. You could just um, put a little sticky thing over the edge of the of the magazine so it didn't um, flick open, and just write the address on the magazine. Yes. And then stick a stamp. Some early fanzines have been sent out basically folded in half and 
as you say, one half just left, so that it writes the address on, and so therefore people can see it's printed matter, because the, the GPO used to get very snotty about that if they discovered something that wasn't in there, um, which is why I, th I believe at one point they, they objected. There was a habit when you did, did a fanzine that way and folded it over, there would be these little boxes there, and next to it would be saying, you're getting this fanzine because, and you tick the box, and it was because um, you've got a letter of comment, you've contributed, uh, you're a good guy, and the bottom one would say, last one unless you do something. And I think the GPO at one point was saying, well, these ticks, this is, yeah, can it be printed material if you're communicating with it? So, but they let it through eventually. So do we have one last question? Okay, so uh, then we thank you very much, Rob Hansen.